Hi, before we begin today, I would like to acknowledge that the California Arts Council and my home are located on the land of the Miwok, Maidu, and Patwin people in present day Sacramento. We practice this land acknowledgement to honor the past, present, and future land stewardship and rich cultural contributions of indigenous peoples. As part of our evolving acknowledgement process, we speak to the space, the contributions of people of the African diaspora who through enslavement and exploitation have built this place. It is also a commitment to rectify the past and present colonial violence inflicted upon indigenous people here and across the world. We invite anyone watching this video to take a moment to honor the indigenous people of your area. Ut ipitik, bienvenidos, welcome to the Arts and Corrections Creative Uplift. I am Mariana Moscoso, a racially mixed and partially detribalized Mayan and Afro-Indigenous queer. I am a parent to an amazing human being and an artist passionate about digital art and zine making. I am also a sibling and a child and the Arts and Corrections Program Manager at the California Arts Council. Also joining me today from the AIC team, Roman Sanchez. Hey everyone, I am Roman Sanchez. I'm a Mexican American theater maker. I am an educator and an organizer. I love to laugh and I am a brother and a son. And I am also the program analyst for the Arts and Corrections program at the California Arts Council. Thank you, Roman. Arts and Corrections is a prison arts program made possible through a partnership between the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation and the California Arts Council. The Arts and Corrections program upholds the following values. People experiencing incarceration are deserving of dignity and respect. Policies should dismantle the root causes of incarceration. Community-based interventions reduce harm and make communities safer by replacing state-sanctioned systems of retribution and punishment, individual and collective accountability for harm and the healing of trauma can create a more safe and just society for all. You can learn more about AIC on our website at www.artsincorrections.org. Thanks, Mariana. And we are thrilled to have with us some folks from our coordinating organizations and some of our former participants, um, now returned residents, here with us to engage in this dialogue about arts and corrections and uh, the work that has been done and the work that we are doing and the work that we want to do in the future. Uh, would everyone in the, in the Zoom room mind um, introducing yourself um, and your, uh, your role and your role with Arts and Corrections? Okay, I, I'll start. <laughs> um, hi, first of all, thank you so much um, for um, inviting, inviting me to participate in this conversation. I am a teaching artist and the Associate Director of Theater Workers Project. Um, we're based here in Los Angeles and um, we do work um, both inside and also with um, returning individuals. And my name is Marlene McCurtis. I don't think I said that. And I'm, my name is Marlene McCurtis. <laughs> Hey, my name is uh, Chanton Bunn. I go by Bunn. Uh, I'm part of uh, Uncuffed and KOW Radio. Uh, and um, I I'm just got out. And, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, forum. And uh, I can't wait to see what comes out of this. Thank you. 
Hey everyone, my name is Louis Brash. I'm a part of Theater Workers Project, Project Refame. Um, I'm formerly incarcerated. Uh, I was released on April 10th, 2020 after serving 25 years. Um, and I'm excited to be here. I worked with Marlene on the inside and I'm uh, looking forward to continuing to work with her out here. Hi everyone, so good to be here with you. Uh, my name is Eli Wirtschafter. I'm an Ashkenazi Jewish American um, from Minnesota and California. Uh, and I work with KALW Public Radio on our project Uncuffed. I'm the director of our training program that's at San Quentin where Bon was at um, and also at Solano where the guys behind me were. Uh, Damon Cook, Brian Mazza, Spoon Jackson, Brian Thames and Joe Kirk who is out of prison now. Uh, so we, we teach them how to make audio stories, do audio interviews, and then to edit those interviews, which we put out in the podcast, Uncuffed. Wonderful. Thank you all so much um, for joining us and for that introduction. So why don't we dig right in here and start with um, what, what drew each of you to Arts and Corrections? Um, what drew you to AIC and what impact has AIC had in your life? No one? Okay. I I'll, I'll go first. I'll go first. Um, uh, for as long as I can remember, I love, I love to draw and I was always interested in, in like, you know, making making things with my hands and, and, and showing people and seeing if, you know, if it could bring them a smile or bring them a memory. Um, during my incarceration, when I first started, I couldn't express, we, we can't express ourselves to people. So most of my expression was through art. Um, I got two boys that I left behind when I was incarcerated. And a lot of times I didn't know how to like express some of my words to them because from my culture, I'm Cambodian. We don't, the male in our family, we don't express love in words or, or in, you know, really anything other than, you know, what I provide for you. Since I'm not providing for them, that whole, that whole cultural, cultural belief crushed it on me. So I had to figure out how can I tell my son how much I love him, show him other than that I love you. So most of the time I would draw drawings and in my drawings, I leave a message in there where, you know, I, I draw a lot of murals. So I leave a message in there and, and they look for it. And like, even with my sisters, you know, and, and it's coming, again, it comes from my culture, we don't communicate with the female part of our family because it's like, you know, I'm the man, patriarchy. So I try to, I have four sisters, so I was like, how do I tell my sister how much I love them, how much I care for them? I do it in my art. And until this day, my, uh, my sister would tell me, I, we always look forward to your letters or your drawing. And, she, and, and everyone is like, we know you draw for like, your sons and us, and there's a lot, but I always look forward to it because when we get it, we always look for your message. We always look for, what are you trying to tell us? And um, so that's how I express my, my feelings, my emotions, my thoughts until I've, I've been in a level four and the shoe for about 15 years, 16 years. And there was no art and correction there. The only art we had was like, hey, get a paper, a pencil and a pen. When I came to San Quentin in about 2015, 2016, one of my friends knew me and was like, hey, bro, you know, there's arts and corrections. I'm like, what is that? So they showed me what art and correction was. I got introduced to painting. I got introduced to embrailing. I got introduced to uh, miniature art. I got introduced to all, uh, all forms of art. And I was like, wow. But then I, I was like, I have a lot in my mind. And I met a guy that worked for, K that did radio for KLW. I played handball with him. And I used to always make fun of him because he's older than me. And then he told me one day, he said, you know what? You have a lot to say. Why don't you try radio? I told him, yeah, right. So, and so I keep on doing that. Yeah, right. Radio my ass. You crazy? 
and he's like, well, you got a lot of stay. So months go by and he's always like, come, come, come. It was a, a Lewis Scott. He's like, man, you need to come over here. You, you have a lot to say. I was like, no, nah, I don't have nothing to say that's interesting. He's like, you're actually wrong about that. He's like, you're, you have things that people need to hear or want to hear. So I gave it, I gave it a chance and I met Nina Ginsburg. I met the whole team. And like, at first I didn't know like if my ideas or what I want to speak about was of any interest to anybody. And then when, when I got the courage to like, here, yeah, this is my idea of my next, uh, my first project. They're like, wow, we never heard this before. And I, I like to introduce a lot of my culture into it or my life experience, my family experience. So my first, my first, uh, uh, my first story was about the genocide in my country and how I helped another younger guy understand his parents and and like the whole team was supportive of me uh k l w and the whole team taught me how how to cut cut paste all the 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 sound bites how to record how to ask questions you know how to turn in a slug and it just opened my mind up to like some these stories people need to hear people want to hear so we could understand each other and I see like my how my story affect my family how it affect the guys around me how it affect my community because when I get feedback like wow we didn't know that and it's like wow that that young man really understood his parents now for a long time he didn't so when uncuff came when the, we had uncuff and we had the round table, the guys and me, me and the guys in San Quentin were like, you know what? We could show our, our ideas to show people that we're not just a number, that we are thoughtful and that we, you know, we learn about ourselves. So when we came up with the round table and when we speak, we speak from the heart. We speak from, from our truth. And, and like what Eli needs to tell us, like, you know what, just, Speak. like Nina say speak you guys you guys could speak from a place where a lot of men can't speak from and and once we got over the you know I don't know how my voice is gonna sound there and and you know once we got comfortable and they taught us like you know it's radio it's okay you could look like shit and you'll be okay so <laughs> so once we got over that then and we had a team that we were comfortable with together in spaces and, and like our producers always say like you know you guys get into deep stuff learn how to learn how to process afterwards how we process going in and it was really I was amazed to hear stories from from different generations different ethnic and we're all sitting there in one spot and we I, we have a guy that's like in his 60s all the way to a kid that's only like 21 and the ideas and, and, and the speeches that they give and it amazed me and it connects us to to people out here and we wanna and, and it showed like, you know what, we're not just a number. We're somebody's brothers, fathers, sisters, we're somebody's grandfather. And and that's what's great about the, the program is now my sister, my kids, my mom could listen to it. My family could listen to it and see, oh wow, you know, you you really you really have changed yourself and understood yourself. And a lot of them said, I've never known this side of you because I've never shown me. I've shown me on the street, me me in my in my traumas. But now that I've shown me, they're like, oh, we didn't know you were going through all this because. Again, in our culture, as a man, we don't say nothing. We're like, okay, we'll take care of it. And the only thing we know is violence or, you know, bunker down and just go through it. So Arts and Correction and, and KLW and, and, and the whole program have uplifted me, my family, the people that know me, and, and I hope hopefully it uplifts the community by hearing our voice. Thank you, Bun. Thank you. Um, Louis, did you wanna? Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. That was, that was an amazing story. And um, I think for me, what drew me to AI, AIC is, is really its absence. Don't touched on a little bit. 
he was on a maximum security prison yard and, and solitary confinement for a lot of years. And I started my time like that too. And, um, and what's like not really unique about maximum security is there's no programming or very little programming, uh, very barren, a lot of violence, a lot of lockdowns. So there was no AIC, uh, there's no arts and corrections. And, you know, that, with that, there was a, you know, there was a big void in my life. Not just from the absence of AIC, but just uh, from the environment, from the isolation, uh, you know, from the gangs. So, like, what a, when I was transferred to Lancaster State Prison in 2013, the system started changing a little bit. More programming started to come in. Uh, and I think AIC was on the verge of coming back to prison because at one point they completely removed it. So, but in 2015, I was still on a maximum security yard and that's when uh, a theater program came to the yard. And I was like, what is this, right? What is this theater program on a maximum security? <laughs> and then they put out sign up sheets. So I signed up. And really when, when I say what drew me to it was the absence is because now I realize that arts and correction, arts is life, you know, and it brought life. It infused life onto the prison yard. And, you know, just from there, I really, really just, I loved it, you know. Uh, and it was, it was about facing my fears because in the beginning I was like, there's no way I'm going to get up on stage because the program was supposed to culminate in a performance. And I was like, there's no way I'm gonna do that. Like, and I was scared to death of it. I'm not gonna lie, I was scared to death, but I did it. You know, I wanted to face my fears. And um, and then in 2000 and a couple of years later, um, that's when I was introduced to Project uh, Theater Workers Project, Marlene, Susie Tanner. And right away when they came to here, I signed up. I was like, Let, let's do this, you know? <laughs> And it was new. It was it was a new experience for me, in that it was a different type of theater. Um, and I think for Marlene and and Susie Tanner, this was the first time in on the inside. Marlene, is that? It wasn't. A, well, it wasn't the first time I had been inside because I had filmed um, inside for like five okay. years. But first time I had come inside to actually teach. So you're right about okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was it was a uh, it was pretty awesome. I I fell in love with it again because after the first um, my first contact with uh, arts and correction, it was like two years of nothing. So I was like, when it when it came back, I was like, let's do it. Um, so you know that's what drew me to it, and the impact. Um, it's just so I mean it's so beneficial. Like I said, it, it's it's life. So it it infuses life back into a, into me. And in into all its participants, I'll say, because it it's a you know it creates a healthy space for um, emotional expression, physical expression. It's a good way for us to. It's very therapeutic. I mean, it incorporates everything that's healthy, um, and and sometimes it's missing from the prison environment. I mean, and how it continues to impact me today, like my relationships, uh, my family, uh, familial. Uh, when I need to do speaking engagements, I draw upon the skills that I learned <laughs> in theater class. Um, you know, my writing skills. Um, it's just like I'm more mindful of, of my movement, uh, my breathing, my thoughts, um, my emotions. It's just so many benefits uh, to it. And, and now how I, I, one of the greatest things I like to identify, I call myself an artist now. I didn't have that before. So, you know. Thank you so much for sharing, Louis. Louis, you spoke on um, the impact that that arts and corrections has inside the institutions. Does would anyone else like to speak about um, what what you think the value of AIC is inside inside? Well, you know, I'll. Um, I mean, first of all, I have to say both Louis and Bon. I mean, what you said is one of the reasons um, I think for me 
I love doing this work. I mean, what you've expressed. I mean, I was taking notes, <laughs> you know, and like, like, you know, because that's kind of what I do. Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering the questions. I'm also responding to what I just heard. Um, I mean, for Theater Workers Project, for us, we really strongly believe that everyone has a story to tell. So we're a theater program that incorporates writing and movement. And out of that, um, our participants, our students tell their story, they perform, they, it culminates in a performance piece. And, um, you know, I think that hopefully that's what we're doing when we come in, we're bringing, we're letting people know one, they're artists, that their, their stories are important, that they, um, that we want to elevate their their experience uh, i think that's very important um to us and we also want to connect as human beings you know uh, susie tanner who's the founder and director of um theater workers project she has this thing that she says and we we always are in a circle and she always says um being in people in a circle was the first form of theater the first form of us connecting and telling our stories and i think that if we can not only allow people to be heard, their stories to be heard, but also to allow their stories to come out of those walls and into society so that everyone will start to know exactly what these men are talking about, that they're more than a number, that they're more than maybe the worst decision they made at one point in their lives, that they are full human beings and they deserve to be heard and honored. So, um, I mean, so for me, Arts and Corrections gives, gives me all of that. And it's interesting, another um, young man that we work with, Alan Burnett, um, and he recently um, came out of Lancaster as well. He told me this story about um, the Wednesdays when we come, right? And he says, like, he knows Wednesday is coming. And we didn't know this, right? So he makes sure he takes a nap. <laughs> before so he is ready and you know so he is ready for us when we come in and when he told me that story it filled me because I don't think I mean in some ways I think we do know but we're not sure I mean we come in and we bring our art and we hope we're making a difference but to hear you know um, Louie talk about it, to hear Alan you know talk about that that he knows that Wednesday when we're coming in he he really that is a, a major part of his day and his week so um hopefully you know we get people's stories told I mean that's really what our mission is and I, I hope we do it well I, I wanted to say just a little bit more on the impact within prison now and um so what it what AIC does is it brings people from all different walks of life together people that would probably never ordinarily share same space together we're talking about people who um, identify as gang members people who um, are from different ethnic backgrounds um, and they they share the same space and in that they connect like marlene said you know through the hu human condition you know when they're sharing that space and i also want to talk about how remember Marlene when um, on one of the graduation performances we had to adjust because I think there was something with the um, family members getting approved whatever happened the adjustment came about in what the family members that were there participating in the ceremony together so when I when I when when that was taking place I was like this is so amazing this is the first, probably the first time for some family members to see their son or, or loved one doing something positive and not only just seeing them doing it with them, they were doing exercises with us. Like that never happens ever. And I thought that was just the most amazing, amazing thing. And, you know, and just to, to you know, connect with people like that and to see people interacting with their family members and to see the joy in their family members and in and, and us, like in sharing that space, that's just something you can't, I mean, it's so valuable, you know, you can't recreate that in, you know, in other programs, not like that. It's just, that's just amazing. Thank you both, thank you both. Got chills a couple of times while y'all were, talking um can i jump in real quick yeah yeah please please Mariana. um 
I just want to thank you both, Glenn and, and Louis, for sharing your stories. Um, from my end, I won't speak for Roman, but we're both in the same work environment at the office. And I think unlike the experience that Marlene and Eli have working with you directly, the way we learn about the impacts is through conversations with the coordinating organizations most of the time and letters that come in. And I know for me, every time I hear every single person's story, every return resident's story, every person that's still inside that they write and tell their story, it impacts me in a way that I really don't have words for. And um, that impact, like people, like often I get asked like, why did I get into arts and corrections? And really it's like through also my own story, right? Like. I had my own experiences with the criminal justice system. I was a high school dropout. I was well in that pipeline heading towards incarceration. And really, in many ways, it was art that saved me. Um, it gave me a vehicle to express myself and to grow um, and really think about um, just what I wanted from life itself. And then I was really inspired by the work of police and prison abolition of Dr. Angela Davis, Mariame Kaba, and Mia Mingus. Um, I, it, that was a really a huge turning point for me personally. And so from like the administrative perspective, I'm driven by my own story, but I'm driven by your stories. I'm driven by the possibility of all of us in our society um, building our power within communities so that we can all achieve liberation where everyone feels safe and has their needs met and happy. And when I hear your stories, I feel like we are building that future together. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you for saying that. I, I ditto and I echo so much of what you said about what drives us in, 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 in our days of screen time, in our days of papers, um, paperwork. It, it, it is the people, it, it is the people that, that continue to drive the work forward. The, the, this next question uh, is for Louis and Bun. Um, what was your, your favorite AIC class? And how do you continue to use the skills that you learned in that class now? Um, one of my favorite class is uh, origami. So we have origami with Auntie June. Um, Origami in a situation where I have to be patient or in a situation where, where I'm upset and I need to calm myself down. Um, I sit out and I was like, you know what? I'm going to fold me a crane and remember what, what that crane stands for and remember what Auntie June taught us. And, you know, every Friday in San Quentin after child, we're going to Auntie June and we're going to be folding, you know, and, we fold for the Hiroshima uh, uh, bombing. We fold for the uh, incarceration of kids for deportation. Uh, you know, we, we fold for different different um, different causes that you know that we, we feel like uh, it's wrong, uh, especially deportation. Um, so that gives me a lot of joy because I, I too am in in the situation of deportation and. For me to see families broken up because of 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 a law that 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 punish immigrants, and so every time every time I I fold one or do something for uh, immigration, I can see my own family's tears and I can see my own tears. So origami and 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 uh, KLW the radio program has given me a lot of a lot of uh, uh, self esteem. Has given has has shown me that I I can give back with my words with my art and and it gives me a, a big sense of community 
where you know I'm supportive and they they are supportive of me. And till this day, those are the skills that I learn. And with with learning how to speak, I speak to my family and others uh, uh, in a way where you know I let them know that they're included. You know that that they have a, a space here, and it just fills my heart with joy, and 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 fulfillment to to do these things and and with the skills I learn, uh, it just you know when I when when I made a crane for my niece and nephew for the first time like two days ago, and they asked me what it was, that fulfills my heart to show them like this is what it is, and to see them like grabbing it like what is that and. To explain it to them. This is like I can never even make up that memory. It's just there, and I have it, and that's what that's what fulfills me to this day. So that's a tough question, though. My, what's your favorite? Uh, I, I I'll say theater by far. You know. Theater by far is my favorite, although there are many like, you know, Bond touched on it, origami, you know, writing, music. I mean, they're all beautiful and wonderful, but for me, theater, um, it's uh, the skill, like, I mean, if if enriching one's soul is a skill, like, <laughs> I'll say, you know, that's that's how it shows up in my life every day. You know, it just enriches your life, but really for this, the, the skills that I took away from theater is the way I think, you know, the way I, my perspective, the way I see the world, the way I view myself. Um, for me, that's the biggest skill um, because it's a part of who I am now. It's not something that I, I, I use um, only in certain circumstances or, you know, it's, it's who, a part of who I am, you know, fundamentally changed who I am for the better. So. Like that's how those skills show up in my life every day. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, this next question is uh, very reflective of the time that we're living in today. Um, how has the pandemic shifted arts programming and what impact have you heard from our community inside the prisons? I can speak to that. Um, so at, at KLW, we've transferred all our in-person programming into correspondence courses um, where students are listening to CDs and are writing. Um, and you know, we, hope, we hope soon we'll give them prompts to listen to, the, to actual radio as well. Um, and you know, it's it's certainly not the same kind of program we had before. There's no question about it that, especially in this environment where um, the only kind of communication we have is on paper, um, and there's so much limited uh, access to technology. You know, I mean, everyone everyone in, in the world basically is going through, and anyone who's in who's a learner or a teacher is going through some kind of challenge with COVID, turning it into virtual programming. Um, but what that means in the prisons is is just so so much more extreme because there's so many limitations. So I know it's it's meant a lot to the people we're, we're we still have in our in our in our courses um, to have that continued contact and a way to continue to express themselves uh, and listen. Um, but you know I can't I, I can't pretend it is what it was. Um, we're also working to get um, a lot of our stories onto the TV systems throughout the prisons so that everyone in the institutions can listen to these stories and hear these guys talking those amazing conversations Bun was talking about across ethnicity, across, across generations. So we're doing that. Um, and another thing we've done is that we've, we really, uh, because we couldn't go inside, we turned to the families and the communities outside. We did an episode of Uncuffed featuring um, people who have loved ones inside prison writing letters to, um, to the, the, the people they know on the, on the inside, whether that's their father or their son. Um, some people who wrote were formerly incarcerated themselves. Uh, and, and they read those letters and you know, that actually became part of the, a packet that our students could listen to. But it also went out um, on our podcast and went out to the listeners. And um, you know, 
the it's 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 such a it's such a terrible time for families who aren't able to visit their incarcerated loved ones. Um, but I'm really grateful that because of our position as kind of as journalists intermediaries between the inside and the outside, we could help facilitate that conversation so that people on the inside can be heard, people on the outside can be heard, and to know we're all you know they're all loved and they're all part of one community still. Thanks, Eli. Actually, I got a couple. Of, I love that letter thing. <laughs> that that's you know because that's I think that's one of the challenges. How do you then you know um, incorporate the families in what you're doing? Um, so for us, um, Theater Workers Project, like Eli, we are also um, all correspondents. It has been a challenge because we're a theater program, and so much of our work is really about building community about. Um, doing exercises, the theatrical exercises. We do a lot of movement. Um, and so we have that as a huge component of our work, but we also do writing. So we're doing a lot of writing exercises um, that we sit inside, have the writing prompts, and then we turn to return those to us. It's a little slower. Um, as the writing teacher, as a writing teaching artist, for me, it's kind of great because I really have a chance now to really look at the work um, and really, you know, not only give more critique, but also give suggestions for rewrites. So, you know, selfishly as the teaching artist, as a writing teacher artist, I love it. But I know that it's really frustrating and, and harder for, our, you know, our theater teacher artist, teaching artists. Um, we also are using photographs and we also are having um, some of, um, we're also using illustrations now so that it, it gets out of the writing as well that, um, our students can also draw or do visual, um, uh, visual re um, um, representations. I guess, I think Louie actually worked with um, a writing exercise um, with Susie that went inside. Um, but one of the things we also are doing, because a, a big component of our program is the performance at the end. And it's bringing, you know, not the family members, inviting the family members in so they can see their loved ones perform. So. We're very fortunate that we also, we just started before the pandemic, we just launched uh, Project Reframe. And Project Reframe is a new theater um, company that, feature, that um, works with uh, formerly incarcerated citizens. So folks that we work with who um, were formerly inside that are now outside. And we also have a, a large reentry um, projects that we work with. They are now gonna be in a theater company. And so what we've decided to do is to take the work of the men from inside, create a, a, a theater piece, and then have the men, formerly incarcerated residents, actually be the actors. So they, they will perform that, um, we'll perform it on Zoom, um, and some other little things that we'll do. We don't, we're still, okay, still in the works. I know there'll be some movement in there as well. Louie is going to be a part of that. And, um, but we will actually record it because recording and having video is a really another big component of our program. And I bring that as a filmmaker to theater workers. So we will rec record it and we will have some type of um, screening and public performance. So the families can also be able to, again, kind of see, you know, see their, their, um, their loved ones work. So that's kind, kind of in the work. And like um, Eli, we also have a lot of videos. We also are trying to um, get in the closed circuit um, television system um, throughout the state. So we're working on that, getting those ready. So it's been a challenge, but I think that, um, you know, we want to continue to provide services. Um, I, I think the men appreciate it. I mean, they're writing, you know, we get to write them letters. Um, and I, I think it's, I'm hoping it helps. I'm hoping that it's helpful. I, I you know, I, I do. So. And I want to thank you both for the flexibility. Um, I know this time has been extraordinarily challenging. Um, and not just you two, obviously KLW and Theater Workers Project, but also all the core dating organizations. Um, we have over 20 
coordinating organizations that are providing what we have called alternative programming inside the institution. And everyone has had to adapt their curriculum to take it inside, um, either through video or correspondence, homework packets. And it's been quite a challenge, but you know, we're starting to receive feedback from folks on the inside and also from our coordinating organizations and the, the role that the arts have played in this time when folks are disconnected more than ever from the outside world. It's really making an impact and the, from the letters we've received, they're asking for more and for it not to stop. And so, of course, we will continue pushing through this this difficult time. Yeah, I, I want to thank you and the Arts Council for being flexible because I think you could have said, well, you know what, that we're, we're paying for in-person programming, we can't do in-person programming, funding is suspended until you can go back inside. Um, and, you know, it, it would have been so hard for the programs to to restart in that case and and we would have had no, no uh, impact on on the people inside and, and they're able to continue to benefit from this program. And, you know, it's, it's not what it was, but, but in a very bleak moment, I think it makes a huge difference. Yeah, I would echo that Eli. And um, it has made a huge difference um, to have the support and, um, you know, to be able to continue and also to keep artists um, working, which, you know, we know that when these economic times and crises happen, the arts really are the first that are, that tend to go, that get flushed out, and the fact that there's a commitment to this means a great deal. So yeah, thanks. Really quickly too, like what's what's really um because I hear from a lot of the men on the inside too. They they call me on the you know all the time, and um and there's a lot of frustration. Um, because of the disconnect, you know, they can't get visits or anything. And um, they do, they do look forward to, to these assignments and to the correspondence. And, and I think too, like when they can see sometimes what organizations have done is put together like pieces, um, maybe just words of encouragement from, you know, and we put, they put it on the institutional channel and just them being able to see that, you know, gives them encouragement, but also like how it shifted it's for for artists it's really kind of forcing a new kind of creativity to come up with ways to you know bring this to you know our brothers and sisters on the inside so and then uh, and for for the men and women on the inside it's how you know it's like there's a different kind of creativity too that goes into it it's infused into their work so it's like you know there's a blessing in this you know it's it's kind of restructuring the way we do things, but I just wanted to you know, comment on that. Thank you. Uh, also, I, I want to uh, say exactly what Louis was saying, because uh, I received one of those packets before I was released, and I went through the, the, the uh, outbreak in San Quentin, and it's like, you know, we were sitting there worried about getting COVID, we were sitting there worried about what's going to happen, we're just, and all of a sudden, here's a packet from KLW. Hey guys, how you doing? We're still going. Here's here's some prompts. You guys read what you guys think about this, and and you know, origami comes here. You guys, you guys, we're folding this, and we're doing, and it it it's a different kind of program, but it gives me a sense that you know what, all our creativity are still being heard, still being seen, and it, and that. When, when those packet comes in, it really helped me to, let's not think about this situation right here, what I can't do nothing about. And then get back into my mind, get back into my daily, cause we're locked down. So get back into like, oh shit, I gotta think of a story. Let's see how I'm gonna pitch this and how I'm gonna write up my slug or I gotta fold this for, for, for this cause. And, and it, it just, even if it's not like what we used to, but it helps us to keep our creativity going. And, and 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 like what Eli said, I thank you guys for not hold, holding back funds because this is a big need and a, a big help for for what the situation is right now. And 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 and, and it's therapeutical. 
So I want to thank you for that. Yes, thank you all. Thank you all so much. Uh, our, our last question for the group is, is a big one. It's a big one. It's how can art be used to create a liberated future? How can art be used to create a liberated future? That's a tough question. Nobody's gonna. <laughs> <laughs> the big one. <laughs> I got thoughts on this. I'll I'll jump in. Okay. Uh, you know, I think a kind of reaction that this programming sometimes gets from people who aren't familiar with prisons is why do why do these people deserve art? Um, these are the worst of the worst. Why do they deserve art? I never had a program like that when I was growing up or my school never had something like that. I, I wish I could make a radio show. I wish I could hang out and make origami. Um, and my response is, yes, you should. You know, Everyone needs opportunities like this in order to be a full thriving human being. Um, you know, I was raised by a father who played violin and he practiced violin with me every night. You know, that was so important to my development as a, as a human being. Um, and I got to do theater and it taught me so much. Um, and so often what I hear from the people on the inside is I really wish, you, like you need to get these programs to the young people um, so that, you know, if, if I had the kind of self-reflection that I have now that I'm doing art when I was young, if I had a program like this, if I had a community like this, if I knew I had, you know, guardians who are looking out for me, um, I would have I would have been able to get myself out of my situation. Um, so I, I want to say that, you know, art, art as a tool for liberation cannot end in prisons. We need art in every school and every community um, and 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 in, in all of our lives, in our adult lives, in our professional lives. It's so key. And I think besides, besides what it does for a person's personal growth and feeling liberated, when someone sees artwork that someone else makes, you immediately have to acknowledge and recognize that person's humanity. And honestly, I think you know, the, the, the policy answers to all this, the struggles we have in our society are not actually that complicated. Um, well, once we start seeing each other as human beings, it's not that hard to figure out how to care for each other. We just start listening and then like see what we have to do. Uh, it's, and it's, it's art that can take us past our, our grudges and our, um, you know, tribalism of, you know, it's just us, us versus them. I'll attempt to answer that question. And I, I think Eli hit it right on the nose. It's not, ours isn't, you know, designated for the incarcerated. It's, it's for everyone, you know, and, um, but I think too, how it can create, you know, a liberated future is, you know, it's like, cause I always say, you know, I found a sense of freedom on the inside and how I was able to do that was through programming, through AIC. Uh, programs like AIC, you develop a sense of freedom on the inside. And once, you know, you can have that sense of freedom, it's it's infectious. You share it with people and people learn and you learn from people and it's infectious. And, you know, and when when people say things like, you know, they don't deserve this or they don't deserve that, that's just, you know, it, you can see it clearly now. It's their trauma. It's their pain. It's their experiences. And you can now we can recognize that they need more arts in their life. They need to have these things in their life. And it's just approaching that from a compassionate and empathetic standpoint. And um, like arts, it creates um, a liberation and a freedom within, you know, and, uh, people. So I think just having that and it's so, it spreads. It's like you, you have that. And then it just spreads and then people can see it and then you can, you know, give it and receive it. It's just, yeah, it's just a beautiful thing. So. Uh, 
Okay, so I think it is. A, I mean, I think it, I think it's a great question, and I think it is a hard question. And I um, and I agree with everything that Eli and Louis have said. I think that infusing art into everything is so important. I think of my own journey as an artist, and I'm much older than all of you on the call, so I remember. Um, the Black Arts Movement, right, as an African-American young girl growing up and um, reading Nikki Giovanni, living in this, growing up in New Jersey in the same town that Amir Baraka had his new art going on and how that infused me and gave me this pride in who I was and really helped me. I mean, I think that's why I am a writer is because I was reading Sonia Sanchez. I was reading Nikki Giovanni. I was reading James Baldwin. I think that art allows us, artists allows us to hold a mirror up so we can see ourselves clearly. Um, and I think that's so important. Um, I'm also very inspired by a quote that Toni Morrison um, says about, you know, that doing times of hard times, art, artists don't despair. We, we create, we write, we, we make change. You know, we, that's how we heal. And I think art as we, is, has this healing, um, ability and I do feel as you know particularly as people of color but everyone we need healing I mean if if we really need healing right now and through this healing and through knowing each other we can create this world that we can imagine right I think we all are imagining this new world and I think there is a time right now for us to start creating that and artists should lead I mean, you know, artists definitely should lead that. And so I'm, um, I mean, I'm thrilled and humbled to be a part of that, that wonderful um, group who calls themselves artists. <laughs> and, um, but we all are artists. So um, I think, you know, so let's create our future together. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's really, you know, um, you know, my take on it. Um, everything I wanted to say, Maureen said it, and so I'll end with, <laughs> I would, yes, art is healing, and in times like this, artists are for future. Sorry yeah. about that. So, yeah, I just want to echo everything Maureen said. That's all I wanted to say. I, I really want to thank everybody for your responses to this question. Honestly, it was my favorite question. <laughs> um, I, I love um, imagination work. I think, um, and you all touched on it, but to me, imagination is the starting point, right? It's the place, it's an ephemeral place, but it's, a, it's an ephemeral space where we can really think about possibilities. It's the step before actually putting our hands or moving our bodies in the action that we're going to take. And so in the imagination, we can think about other possibilities for ourselves, our communities, the world. And so um, it's the place where creativity begins, right? Creating. Um, and so liberation to me is going to happen because art embodies that, right? It's interdependent. Theater is dependent on all everyone who is participating. It makes us accountable because we're the creators of our artwork. And all of these things that art embodies is like in antithesis to punishment and to dehumanization. It's, it's the core of humanity. And so um, thank you so much, all of you, for your responses. Um, I'm just going to throw in a plug that pretty soon we're going to be changing the program name and part of that process, it's been a year that we've been moving slowly towards this and I think part of the hold back, of course, was the pandemic. Um, but we're really excited because we, we created these beautiful brochures where we wrote a quick little note to everyone that receives the survey and let them know that we're thinking of them and we're still here. And we want you know, everyone who, who looks at that survey to understand where we're coming from. And we realize 
that we can no longer really have corrections in the name. It can no longer be arts and corrections. We got to go beyond that. And, and I was talking about how much I love imagination work. And this is part of it, right? Like we are reimagining what arts is going to look like from the inside. And so a lot of the responses that we got in our community engagement opportunities and the survey really looked at transformation. We're looking at reimagining. And so um, I'm really excited. I think by the new year, we should have a new name. And I'm really excited to see what the future holds. And it's really thanks to all of you that it's possible. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all uh, artists that are, that are joined this Zoom room, this round table. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure and honor to hear your perspectives and hear your stories and to um, hear your thoughts on arts and corrections and um, what a liberated future looks like. So on behalf of the entire Arts and Corrections team and the California Arts Council, we thank you all so, so much for your contributions and uh, we hope to stay in touch. Thank you. Please do, thanks so much. Thank you. Everyone, thank you. <laughs> in an honor. <laughs>